and that you enjoy the evening and the music. Um, for, for us, Athletic uh, is, is very special. The team is very special. Um, they arouse much passion in people and it goes to prove that you can have passion in people even when you uh, don't win a lot. Um, but what is interesting is that of course the women's team win a lot. Uh, in fact, they, they have won the Liga five times. But we didn't hear too much about that last night. But anyway, uh, just really I hope you enjoyed us and that you will remain Athletic Bilbao supporters for the rest of your days, um, like we all are here in Bilbao. Welcome back also to our global audience. Uh, we were looking at some statistics and um, we have had people watching us live from all over Europe, I have to say. Interestingly, we've also had people watching us from outside of Europe. So, we had people looking at us from Singapore. I wonder who that could be. <laughs> so, we also had some people watching us from Miami. We also had people watching us from Calgary in Canada. And there was even one person watching from Jakarta in Indonesia. And in the interest of transparency, I have to tell you, that person was my sister. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we also got lots of questions. Um, not only uh, using Slido, but we got lots of questions um, uh, during the parallel sessions. And we got questions from London. <laughs> Now, what questions might people from the UK be asking? <laughs> we got, of course, questions from all over Europe. Also, a lot of questions from Brussels. So, uh, on the whole, I think um, the, the, the web streaming has, has been a success and that it, it has allowed more people to join us. Um, I'd like to ask you now for one last poll to take out your phones. Um, and we're going to use Slido one last time. I'm going to explain a little bit this to you before we put up the question. Um, as the European Commission is now here in force, and there is an emphasis on robust data, an emphasis on evidence-based surveys, we decided that this final one is going to be one that we can really get reliable data from. We used some advice from the American Psychological Association to get the spectrum of answers just right. And the question will be, question will be, how would you describe your experience attending the Healthy Workplaces Summit? And now, Iris, we're going to put the categories up and I'll ask you to vote. <laughs> you get 30 seconds to tell us if it was brilliant, fantastic, amazing, or inspirational. Voting is open. And by the way, don't be restrained. You can vote more than once. Vote often. We're a bit diminished in the numbers because some people went back already to their destinations. So, you know, vote as often as you like. So, uh, have you all voted? Yeah? Okay, Iris, can we see the result, please? Now, what I would draw from that is that this is a positive result. <laughs> And uh, yes, uh, this is positive. We can definitely use this in our evaluation later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaking of evaluations, uh, later on in your packs, there are proper evaluation sheets, not the ones that I control. And uh, in there, you need to put, uh, you need to put your, your, we'd really like it if you would evaluate us because that makes us bigger. So now we're coming to the final session and we have two amazing speakers um, for you. Um, the first, um, 
uh, the first is um, Andrew Smith. And he is currently acting director of the agency. So he's filling in for Krista as well. And he has a lot on his plate. But Andrew, could I ask you to come up now? And Andrew is going to give us a preview of what you can expect from the next campaign. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, yeah, a lot of responsibility on these shoulders at the moment, but I'll try and do my best to honour uh, Krista in her absence. And now, as we're nearing the end of this summit, which we now know empirically has been a great success, uh, and the close of the 2016-17 campaign on ageing, I'd like to take this opportunity to look ahead to our next campaign. Now, unlike ageing, which is visible, and in my own case and under these lights, all too visible, uh, our next campaign will focus on something that is often not visible, and therefore all too often not identified as a risk by many workers and employers, dangerous substances. The fact is that dangerous substances are far more common than most people think. Dangerous substances affect millions of workers across Europe, but the extent of this exposure and the associated risks are often underestimated or ignored. Many are unaware that not only are chemicals pose risks, but lo that lots of other commonly used substances across all sectors can be hazardous if their use is not managed effectively. Dangerous substances can have serious consequences for workers' health which is bad for workers, bad for business, and bad for society in general. Workplace exposure to dangerous substances leads to many types of health problems, which can be acute, such as eye or skin irritation, or more long-term, including allergies, lung diseases, and even cancer. In fact, it's estimated that carcinogens in the workplace cause around 80,000 deaths per year in the EU and are directly associated with costs of around 2.4 billion euros each year, and this is simply unacceptable. The recent SNA2 survey gives us some insight into the magnitude of the problem. For instance, almost 40% of the European enterprises report that chemical or biological substances are used in their workplaces, and almost one in every five workers Safade reported being exposed to chemicals for at least a quarter of their working time. What's more, this situation does not seem to be improving and has remained relatively unchanged over the last two decades. Dangerous substances are particularly prevalent in certain sectors, such as agriculture, manufacturing and construction. However, no sector is completely free from them. It's crucial then that all employers take steps to identify risks and protect workers. It doesn't matter whether they are hospital staff who, who are using cleaning products, bakers exposed to flour dust, or bus drivers who might breathe in exhaust fumes. All workers are potentially at risk from dangerous substances in some form or another. To prevent the associated harms, it's crucial that we challenge misconceptions and raise awareness of the risks posed by dangerous substances in the workplace. We must promote a culture of risk prevention so that dangerous substances can be eliminated from the workplace or the risks can be effectively managed. These are among the aims of the Healthy Workplaces Manage Dangerous Substances campaign, which will launch in April 2018. To achieve its goals, the campaign will focus on getting several key messages across, and I'll touch upon three of these messages now. The first relates to the fact that often we cannot tell whether a substance is dangerous or not with any of our five senses. This is very different from the situation with, say, noise, vibrations or heavy lifting, for example, all of which are easy to detect and therefore easier to avoid or at least take measures to reduce the risks. Consequently, 
Raising awareness and increasing knowledge is particularly important in the case of dangerous substances. Moreover, as previously mentioned, it's not just manufactured chemical products that, that are labelled with risk and safety information that can cause harm. Some dangerous substances, such as welding fumes or quartz dust, are generated during work processes, while others, like grain or flour dust, come from natural sources. Even water can have a negative impact on health in situations of professional overexposure. Just think about dishwashers in restaurants, for example. Without appropriate risk management, skin problems could arise, having an impact on the worker and their ability to do their job. Therefore, the campaign will raise awareness of all types of dangerous substances, not just the obvious ones, and emphasise the importance of risk assessment in all se sectors as a first step towards prevention. Another key message that the campaign intends to convey is that there are solutions to the problem. Once a risk has been identified, there are ways to deal with it, and we aim to share good practices and make employers aware of the ways in which they can eliminate or substitute dangerous substances or processes with those that are not dangerous or those that pose fewer risks. Employers should always adopt such an elimination or substitution approach if at all possible. But many don't realise this or are unclear on how to go about it. We have collected several case studies and good practice examples for the campaign, demonstrating how this can be achieved. If such elimination or substitution is not possible, technological solutions or organisational changes must be considered. Many existing technological solutions and organisational options, such as more careful purchasing, will be highlighted by the campaign, along with resources aimed at helping employers to come up with practical solutions that suit their own workplaces. As a final result, if nothing else is possible, personal protection is of course essential. The four-step hierarchy of prevention measures, substitution, technological measures, organisational measures and personal protections is often known as the STOP principle and is a key element of European safety and health legislation. The campaign aims to help employers access information on approaches to prevention and put them into practice. As I said earlier, some substances used in the workplace can cause cancer and this is all too common. However, many causes of occupational cancer are preventable and this brings us to another key objective of the campaign. Employers need to be aware that much stricter measures apply to carcinogens than to other substances in the workplace. This is essential to preventing the harm caused by exposures to carcinogens at work, not to mention the costs. In May last year, EU OSHA, along with five other national governments and European organisations, confirmed their commitment to tackling this issue by signing a covenant and drawing up a three-year roadmap on carcinogens. This action plan aims to raise awareness among employers and employees of the risks of carcinogens, particularly in small and medium-sized enterprises, which find tackling this issue particularly challenging, as resources are often limited. The scheme also aims to disseminate information on risk assessment and management and identify smart solutions and share good practices. As part of EU OSHA's commitment to this roadmap, carcinogens will be a particular focus of the Healthy Workplaces Manage Dangerous Substance campaign and EU OSHA will organise an annual event to promote the roadmap and monitor its progress. Raising awareness and providing practical solutions and guidance are at the heart of all our Healthy Workplaces campaigns. To accompany the 2018-19 campaign, we have created a database containing more than 600 practical tools and resources relating to dangerous substances in the workplace, collected both at European and Member States levels. These tools will be available on the agency's websites. They target in particular labour inspectors, small and medium-sized enterprises and worker representatives and aim to raise awareness and provide ideas and good practice examples of how to eliminate 
or reduce the risks associated with dangerous substances at work. An interactive, user-friendly e-tool has also been developed to enable small businesses, in particular, to manage dangerous substances. And to com complement the range of tools, info sheets and in infographics for the campaign, a range of audiovisual materials has also been produced. These materials are designed for awareness raising and to enhance the impact of the campaign's messages by providing clear, easy to understand visual demonstrations of how workers can be exposed to dangerous substances and how the risks can be prevented. And to end with, I'd like to share with you one of the videos included in the resources database. It is in fact one of the winners of the 2017 edition of the International Media Festival Prevention. It's called The Asthma of Antoine the Baker. It's a French film and it has some quite uh, surreal subtitles, but uh, if you forgive that, it's, uh, hopefully you'll still get the gist of it. It received an award for the use of humour and direct communication. And as part of the jury at, at, at that uh, conference, I really like the engaging performance of Antoine, a young apprentice baker who discovers the risks linked to his job and the significance of flour dust as a hazard in artisanal baking. And we'll watch a slightly edited version of it now. Hier, j'ai appris un truc euh, un peu étrange, très étrange même. Genre, il y a des allergies respiratoires qu'on peut attraper à cause de la poussière de farine. <rire> c'est pas euh, top top. Non. Et puis c'est pas comme si moi, en tant qu'apprenti boulanger, euh, la farine, euh, vous voyez Bon, ah finalement, monsieur, je, je, je vais faire un charcutier ou, ou médecin ou, ou mécanicien, j'en sais rien. Je vous rassure, parce qu'en fait, on m'a expliqué que déjà, c'était considéré comme des allergies professionnelles. Ouais, ça serait bizarre, dit comme ça. Bonjour, je suis allergique professionnel. Alors, vous allez me demander... Euh... À quoi ça ressemble une allergie à la poussière de farine Eh bien, il y en a deux principales. La première, on a le nez bouché, les yeux rouges qui pleurent. Pour résumer, c'est un peu comme euh, si on venait de se faire larguer par sa nana. Ou alors si elle vous avez trompé avec euh, Joseph. Vas-y, va pas. C'est Sonia, elle est partie, c'est ça Non, ça va, je t'assure. Tu sais, tu peux tout me dire, hein, tu peux te confier à moi. Non, mais ça va passer, t'inquiète pas. Ah, t'es fort. C'est beau. Et la deuxième, c'est l'asthme. L'asthme, ça s'écrit à A S M A S. Alors l'asthme, en fait, c'est quoi Vos bronches sont irritées, se rétrécissent un peu et perturbent ainsi la circulation de l'air pendant la respiration. Et donc parfois, quand vous expirez l'air, ça fait une sorte de sifflement. Imaginez qu'on soit plusieurs au labo à avoir ça. Alors moi, personnellement, j'ai pas trop envie de ressembler à un mec dépressif ou à une flûte à bec. Ou, ou un mélange des deux, d'ailleurs. Donc j'ai appris tous les petits gestes du quotidien au labo qui permettent d'éviter d'avoir de la poussière de farine dans le nez. Notamment quand on vide les sacs. Et ensuite, il y a des petits trucs et astuces. Par exemple, quand vous nettoyez votre pain de travail du surplus de farine. Ça, euh, non, non, non. Pour ça, il vaut mieux utiliser le coup pad Et puis surtout, le plus important, bon, c'est assez étrange, mais on m'a demandé de me laver le nez. Et oui, c'est la première fois que j'entends ça. Petit, on m'avait jamais demandé de me laver le nez. Mais c'est important. Si comme moi, vous voulez éviter de ressembler à une flûte à bec qui pleure. Hein Hopefully, after seeing that, if you are harboring any doubts at all, I'm sure that you now all recognize the importance of managing dangerous substances in European workplaces. And I, along with all of you, I should very much hope that we can count on your support for the 2018-19 campaign to ensure that Europe's workplaces are protected from dangerous substances and hazardous workplace practices. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. And now, as Krista isn't here with us, uh, Stefan Olsen 
from the European Commission has very kindly offered to do the closing remarks. So that makes three people who have replaced Krista. <laughs> For the summit, we had Coroli, we had Andrew, and we had Stefan. So um, that, that should make her feel pretty good in her hospital bed. Um, Stefan, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because um, I did ask every other speaker when they would come up to tell us what they think is the best and the worst thing about aging. I didn't give you any time to prepare, so you can come up and answer or you can completely ignore the question. But anyway, I'd like you to come and give us your closing remarks. Thank you. Many thanks, Brenda, and uh, it's a real priv privilege to be here with all of you because uh, you know what you're doing. Uh, you are experts, you, you deal with health and safety daily, and it's very, very nice to see you together, to see this dialogue, which I think also is reflected in the, in the very objective uh, survey done by Brenda here, in that the inspirational part, I think it actually matters because it means that most of you feel that you'll bring things with you from this event, from this campaign, uh, that will be important in practical terms in the future. Because it doesn't end with this campaign, it only starts, no? Uh, we know uh, very well, and, and in my other roles uh, that I have as, as director in the Commission, I deal with issues like uh, youth unemployment or... or uh, uh, institution building in a number of member states and and what we see is that the demographic developments is affecting everything no we're moving from this uh, pyramid that we used to talk about and that most of us uh, learned about in school to something that isn't a demographic pyramid anymore it's more of a a romb, I think, and it's, it's going to be an upside-down pyramid soon. And as I heard in, in the workshop this morning, a lot of you in your daily work, uh, I heard it was very impressive uh, numbers from Continental, for example, about how the workforce will look in 2020 uh, because of this demographic development and what, what we need to do to stay as societies, uh, as uh, economies, as businesses, as individuals, to stay uh, competitive, to stay happy, to, to stay productive, that really requires a new way of thinking in terms of how we deal with health and safety at the workforce. And I think this campaign uh, and, and the dialogues we've had here during these two days uh, are really, really important in that, in that respect. Coming back then, I'm, you, you're thinking he's going to dodge the question, no? Uh, so, uh, for me, with aging, uh, I have a pretty stressful job, as, as most of you, and the way I deal with that is by going running uh, very, very far, and uh, uh, a bit like, you know, the film Forrest Gump. Uh, so, in, in that perspective, and the problem I have is that I can't do it anymore because my legs start protesting. Uh, and the doctors tell me that that's because I'm too stressed, so my back uh, gets all kind of tense, and then I go running, I don't have flexibility, and then my legs start fighting with me. And so that's, that's for me, a very real issue, because if I can't do the running, how do I deal with the stress? And, and this is, you know, and I think that shows, that's a very individual, this is a crazy person that needs to go running for, for many, many kilometers, uh, the, 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 the work stress, the aging will affect uh, many of you in a different way, no? So I think, and, and that's something that I have seen and I've heard by talking to people here, it is that we need to look at the whole work situation. I know uh, Viking uh, and, and, and the Finnish uh, developments are looking very much at the workability concept and putting the issue of health and safety in a broader perspective. And I think this is also what this campaign has been about and the discussions here. It is really to see all the issues together and to see how as employers, how as trade unions, as individual workers, we can deal with that concept in order to, to stay in the workplace, to, to use our abilities. Because what we see from the Commission perspective, it is, and when we talk to employers, it is that possibly the biggest 
uh, challenge we have right now uh, for, for the, to sustain the economic recovery that we're seeing, it is that we don't have enough skills in the workplace. Uh, the, the, the biggest fear now, if you talk to a Swedish employer or a German employer, is really, and I'm, I'm sure some of you can testify to that, it is really that we don't have uh, enough skilled people in the workforce to, to take up the orders, to keep the productivity. Uh, and, and, and that immediately leads us to, to having a productive workforce longer uh, in, in, in place. And we can only do that by a very creative uh, way of working. And, and as I, when I discussed this with Jesus, now uh, we see that at this event, this discussion is coming out very much here from you, from your knowledge, that really um, we need to draw from all these good experiences. We need to learn from each other because you're all facing the same challenges. Possibly the Finnish experience is a bit different because the social uh, system is different that, that complements and deals with the insurance and, uh, uh, and social security issues than the Bulgarian system. But I don't think we, we, those differences are big enough so that we can't really learn from each other. And I know also that you are creating networks between each other in order to uh, exchange data to, to understand these issues. And as Brenda told me, uh, asked me to, to remind you, we have collected a lot of information in the context of this campaign, and EU OSHA has done, as usual, a great job. Uh, so we have a, on the website, don't forget that there, uh, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of experiences that you can go back and draw on. And I think you're all convinced in this room, but it's very important also to spread that message because we can't afford not using the experiences that, uh, that, we, that everybody's doing and learning from each other's mistakes. So, so I think that for me sums up the importance of this type of campaign. And this will be, as, as Andrew explained, this will be very much carried over in the uh, Dangerous Substances campaign. And I think we saw from the film here why, why it's very good to have professionals like, like Andrew and his colleagues to deal with this type of campaign. And I'm very happy that it's not the commission that's doing the campaign because we're not, we, we, you need to be good at this type of thing. And we saw from this film that the EU OSHA is really well placed to, to manage this type of, of activities. I uh, will not speak too long. You've had a, so, so let me just uh, say a few crucial things. Uh, one is to really thank all of you who have been part to, to point out the strength of this system with the focal points, with partners, and also to acknowledge that you're doing so much work, which is on probably on top of your other work, in order to make this work. Uh, that's one element. The other element, I think, which I've seen, I stood here for the first time since we had a reorganization in, in, in DG Employment, uh, exactly two years ago, I stood here for, for uh, uh, an, another event, and then I knew that tripartism, I remembered from my past on, on these issues that tripartism was crucial, but what I've learned during these two years in, in all the legislative proposals we've done on, on updates of the carcinogens, the evaluation of the, the OR strategy, that it's really through tripartism that we make OSH work. And this is this campaign, the focal points and all of these actions. And I think by having this acknowledgement in, in, from the, in the commission communication, which we produced earlier this year, but also in the social pillar, which was uh, proclaimed yesterday in Gothenburg, uh, that OSH is crucial for the European project, but that it only works via tripartism and that each actor has uh, their own, uh, have their own uh, uh, responsibilities in this. So it's not about saying that now EU takes over. No, we stay with the same type of uh, division of responsibilities. And I think in, in, in health and safety, this works better than anywhere else 
because we are having tripartism in all the layers, in the preparation of, of policies, in the execution of policies, in communication like here, and uh, in, in the, the whole dialogue. So that, that's my, my second point. And uh, the third point that I would like to, to just reiterate is it doesn't stop here. The issue of the demographic developments, the aging workforce, and the need for uh, that has been taken up here, the intergenerational uh, solidarity, the, the need for intergenerational exchange of learning from each other in the workplace, and being investing really in how in, in innovative approaches, uh, like we've heard many here, will be essential for the productivity of the, of the individual enterprise, for the economy as a whole, and I'm not exaggerating there. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that if we can't keep the skilled labor and, and keep them as mentoring the young and having a, 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 a diverse workforce, uh, that's, we, we will not, as a European economy, we will not be able to sustain our, our achievements. Um, so, so I think that that's, that's, that's really crucial that we continue to work on this and we continue to be innovative and exchanging good practice. Finally, I would like to say on, on the replacement, usually it takes three men to replace a woman, so I'm not that uh, surprised. So have a very good trip back and uh, I'd like to, to thank uh, very much Iwosha, uh, very much the, everybody who's been organizing this because it's amazing how well this always works. So, so it's well invested money, and that's very nice to see. So, but please continue to take this further and have a very good trip back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, as eloquent as ever. Um, we in EU OSHA would like to add our thanks also to the speakers, to the panelists, the people who did the preparation, and also to our excellent moderator yesterday, who was so lively um, from the Netherlands. Uh, Ruben, I hope that, uh, that you enjoyed it too. We enjoyed having you. Um, so come on up, Napo and Napet. Are you... It's probably too difficult for you to do the stairs, is it? Yeah. Mm. Is it dangerous? Right. Okay. So uh, we're joined here now by Napo and Napet. If you would like to take some photographs before you leave. Um, we just have a couple of th more thank yous. I'd like to say thank you to the interpreters because they've done a great job. I'd also like, I have four words for our guests here from the United Kingdom. Are there any of them left? Are there some here from the UK? Great. There you are. Four words. You are always welcome. Please uh, give your headphones back. Please fill in the real evaluation, but thank you for filling in the other one. That's the one we'll submit to the Commission. <laughs> Please fill in the real evaluation as well. Um, we have lunch for you outside. And uh, on behalf of all of my colleagues here, I'd like to say you've been a wonderful audience and you've been very participative. Thank you and safe travels home. <laughs>